This is a Clark UT60D all-terrain forklift. Today's the day. This is a brand new starter. I also bought a brand new battery and we watched a master injection pump rebuilder rebuild this injection pump. I had no idea you guys had this capability. So yeah, that's basically it for building your pump. Well, that's an ominous sign. All right, folks, the snow is gone. The forklift is right where we left it. Got a few things to do before we can actually drive it and use it. The fuel tank's a mess, we've gotta deal with that. The cable for the forward and reverse is frozen. We've gotta replace that. And the tires are flat. We've gotta figure out how to put some air in those. There's a few other housekeeping chores. We need to change the oil, check some of the other fluids, give it a grease job, you know, the usual stuff. So let's get to it. Well, there was a little strip of something in here. Not sure what this material is. Cork, maybe? petrified whatever whatever it happens to be anyway for some reason I had a roll of shingle starter course in my truck so we'll cut some strips off of that stick on there I don't think it's really necessary but Might as well do something. All right, folks, we're gonna install the fuel tank. It has been cleaned and repaired, and that's a whole story in and of itself. Left off, this is the fuel tank for the Clark UT60D forklift. I brought it back to the shop, I cleaned it up, and you might wanna sit down for this. I found some problems. This is the bottom side of the tank. And this little guy right here is kind of the pad that the fuel tank rests on. And yeah, I don't think you're supposed to be able to see light through it. Once I found all the holes, pinholes here, I decided just to cut the bottom of the tank out, this whole rusted section. That way I could access the inside of the tank and clean it out a little bit more easily. And the whole inside was covered in this. It's a combination of rust and solids, I guess, from the diesel fuel, plus 30 plus years of neglect. This is the float for the sending unit for the fuel gauge. It's got a hole in it, so I went ahead and took it out. I don't know if the gauge works. The wiring's missing for it anyway, so we're gonna go ahead and disable that. And then several people commented that there should be a filter screen in the bottom of the fuel tank. I think that's what's left of it. Well, to fix this problem, I busted out my super Chinese Harbor Freight hammer and dolly set. And then I channeled my inner Fitzy and I made up a patch panel. 
This is 16 gauge steel. It's a little bit thicker than the original, but I think it'll work. And I don't have any kind of a shrinker or stretcher or anything like that, so I chose to just cut it where the kind of where the bends were, and we'll have to weld that up. But I think it'll work just fine. We've got to convert my welder over to a smaller diameter welding wire. I normally run 35 thousandths wire. I think it's like 0.8 or 0.9 millimeter. But that's overkill for sheet metal. We'll have a hard time with it. This is a Millermatic 200 MIG welder. Alright, we have to replace this guide and the two rollers. This is our drive roller kit, so it comes with both rollers and the guide. On the gun, we have to switch over the tip, and we have to replace the liner that the wire runs through. This Liner is for 35 to 45 thousandths wire, and I have used it with thinner wire before, but it's not ideal, especially this is a kind of an extra long lead on it. Anyway, this welder has been converted to a Tweco gun, and I've always hated it. It's heavy, it's really kind of awkward. I don't like the way the trigger works. The tips are expensive. The other consumables are pretty expensive and they're getting hard to find. And the tips always come loose. And then the biggest problem is with the nozzle. So it has this ceramic isolator here and it just doesn't hold the nozzle very tight. And if you get the slightest amount of buildup inside this nozzle and then it kind of cocks over like this, it shorts out to the tip and then you have a bad day. So, rather than futz with that, I bought a whole new gun. This is a Miller MDX series gun. It's fairly new on the market, I think. Don't know that much about it, but it seems a lot better. It's more like the, the Bernard style guns, which I prefer. So we're gonna switch it over. So if I loosen it here, pull this gizmo out. This is the adapter that adapts the Tweco gun to fit in the Miller welder. So you have to switch the gas hose back over. Cut yourself. <clears throat> there we go. Well, this is the original hose. It runs over to the back side of that little clamp that we tightened up when we installed the gun. Now one more thing while we're working on this welder. I noticed these panel connectors are loose. This is where you switch the welder from high range to low range. So you actually have to unplug this big connector and plug it into the other side. Anyway, I think we can just tighten these up. All 
Okay. There we go. Now with these smaller 10 pound rolls, you need a spacer. This is one I made out of a tube of cardboard. A little bit crude, but it gets the job done. Rock and roll. Enough stalling. Time to weld the tank. I'll be honest, I've never welded a fuel tank before. So I used up a lifeline and I phoned a friend. This guy's forgotten more about welding than I'll ever know. And he's welded hundreds, possibly thousands of fuel tanks. What he told me is as long as the fuel tanks only ever had diesel fuel in it, you can weld it just like it is. You don't need to purge it. You don't need to fill it with water. You don't need to do anything. You'll be just fine. If it's ever had any kind of gasoline or solvent or anything put inside, all bets are off. Anyway, I think what we're going to do, we will go ahead and fill it up with water just because it's easy to do. And there will still be a little air pocket up here at the top and then we'll go ahead and weld it. He also said basically that it would have been better, well it would have been better to just leave this part of the tank alone and then put a cap over it. But I chose to cut it out so that I could get inside and clean it. He also said, as far as the patch goes, that I should have made it so that it overlapped instead of being a, a butt weld. But I had already made the patch by the time I, I talked to him, so we'll try to struggle through that. Anyway, let's get to it. I think it's going to be fine. Don't weld a gas tank, please. There's just no, there's no way to do that safely that I know of. I'll tell you guys a couple stories. A few years back, there was a guy locally who did some welding on a pontoon boat, an aluminum pontoon boat, and he started welding on one of the pontoons, and he didn't know that the gas tank had dripped gas down inside that pontoon, and it blew up and killed him. And my dad was telling me that years ago, a salvage company actually salvaged a large fuel storage tank out of the Mississippi River and it had been sitting submerged under the water for years and they started cutting it with a torch and it blew up and killed the guy so yeah be careful that'll work. I'm going to clean this up a little bit and then we'll flip it over and see how much it leaks. It's done. It holds water. I'm uh, I'm over it. Hi lady. Hi. We got a lot of stuff in the back there. Looks like maybe some goodies from Area Diesel Service. <gasps> Did I get another sweatshirt? You might have. This this looks significant. This is kind of tiny. It might fit me though. I think I said medium. Yeah, this will fit. All right. This is cool. Kiddos on golf cart detail. Uh, yeah. Welding a fuel tank. Are you done freaking out over here? I got a hat. I don't think it's for you. You know what? There's two of them. There's two of them. <laughs> uh. Oh, sweet. Look at this. You sent me a cup. I needed a new coffee cup. All right, lady. Taking over everything here. Exciting. Oh, 
That one just has a bore. That one just has a boring old injection pump in it. All right, the tank's done. That did not go well. Let's put it that way. The big problem I ran into is that I didn't cut out a, a big enough opening. And so here, it looks like solid metal, but there's still significant amounts of rust. And as soon as I started welding it, I just started blowing holes through that rust. And what I ended up doing was just putting a, a strip over top of the weld that I'd already made. So I basically tripled the amount of welding that I had to do. And then even still, I was blowing through and popping holes and ended up having to add all kinds of patches. And it's a mess. But nobody's ever going to see it. And it's liquid tight. So I think it'll be just fine. But I've definitely wasted slash invested way more time than I wanted to in fixing this tank. I think it points like that. Well, it seems like Clark or John Deere or whoever was in charge of this end of the machine, they never intended this fuel tank to come out without removing the radiator. And I don't want to do that because it's a pain in the butt. So I did everything, everything just short of removing the radiator. I took the, the, uh, radiator mount bolts loose, I removed the shroud, and I removed the fan. And that allows me to scoot the radiator over just far enough that I can put the fuel tank in, I think. Well, that was easy. All right, the fuel tank's buttoned up. I went ahead and installed the fan, the shroud, and the radiator. I did have to take the upper radiator hose loose, so we spilled a little bit of coolant. I'll have to top that off before we get too crazy. I tightened the fan belt. Everything on the back side of the engine is pretty much ready to go. Well, a few people wanted to know how to time the injection pump, so I'll show you how it works on this engine. It's pretty straightforward. Down here on the side of the injection pump is a timing window. This pump only has one timing window. Some of the standardine pumps have one on either side. Inside the timing window, there's two timing marks. One is on the cam ring. That one's more or less fixed. It only changes with the timing advance inside the pump. And the second timing mark is on the weight basket. So that one rotates with the input shaft of the pump. So you want to line those two up. Now in this particular application, someone's already marked the housing in the back of the timing cover. So if we remove the pump and then reinstall it and line up these marks, the timing should not change. And there's not enough room for that shaft to move far enough for the gears to come out of mesh. So the timing inside the cover can't change. And if we line these marks up, the timing inside the pump can't change. But if it does change, I'll show you how to check that. Of course, every engine's different. In some cases, you'll find timing marks on the flywheel. So there is an inspection cover here, but there are no timing marks on the flywheel of this engine. So on this John Deere engine, the timing mark is on the front crank pulley, and it lines up with a pointer that's cast right into the front timing cover, right there. And there's two marks. One's marked zero, and one's marked S. On this engine, it was timed off of the zero mark. And I know that because I set the timing before I took the pump off. So if you don't know, and you don't want to mess it up, the best thing to do is to line up the timing marks inside the pump before you remove it, and then don't touch the engine until you reinstall the pump. All right, we're gonna replace the fuel filter. Well, this is new, I did replace this last winter. You guys didn't see it, because I never released the video, but I actually came down here and did some more work on this machine trying to get it to run. And part of that effort was to replace the fuel filter. But we're going to do it again, based on the condition of the fuel tank. 
think it's a safe bet. This is kind of a weird fuel filter design. This is standard John Deere stuff. Oh, there we go. This is non-biodiesel, which is not easy to get here in corn country. I asked the guys at Area Diesel if they recommended or endorsed any kind of fuel system additive or cleaner. This is what they sent me. It's actually made by Sanodyne, the same people that, well, it's sold by Sanodyne, the same people who make the pump. And I think we only need three ounces for 10 gallons, so a little bit goes a long way. Kind of messy though. Gotta bump it over a little bit. It must be right on the cam lobe for that stupid transfer pump. Actually hit the drain pan this time. Wasn't expecting that. That's all Well, apparently the original oil cap was lost at some point, so they just jammed this three-quarter fine thread bolt through some kind of a rubber bushing and <laughs> stuffed it in there. Well, that's not ideal, but I was able to get a replacement straight from the John Deere dealership. Big thanks to Brian Block for helping me out with the part numbers because Clark, Clark had no idea what I was looking for. This control cable is what shifts the machine from forward to reverse. It's kind of a weird setup on this forklift. You got a gearbox here. I think it's four gears. And then there's a lever on the console that shifts forward to reverse, but there's no neutral position on the reverse lever, like a normal forklift. And there's no torque converter. It uses a clutch with a hydraulic dump valve. It's kind of more like a tractor or a backhoe that has a reverser than a normal forklift. Anyway, it works fine, it's just a little unusual. Anyhow, this cable's froze up, it's no good. I called the Clark dealership $350 for a replacement, which is insane. Even the parts guy was like, there's no way anybody would buy that. So, I did some digging, tried to find an equivalent. I asked Brian Block if there was a John Deere part number for it. He dug a little bit, couldn't find an equivalent. He suggested I check out Midwest Control. I contacted them and they kind of put together a quote for a matching cable. It was still going to be like $150, which is 
a little crazy, I think. Anyway, what I ended up doing is buying this one from McMaster Car. It's a standard cable, two inch stroke, six foot length. It's about five inches longer than the old cable, but there's plenty of room down there. I think it'll work just fine. This one, 75 bucks. We've had some visitors inside the electrical panel. That'll work. I'm not set up for wiring repairs today. So I don't know what we're gonna do with this. Put the panel back on and forget about it. Well, electrical tape's gonna have to do for now. I'm not set up for a full-on rodent exorcism. Now the tilt cylinder seal's blown out. All right guys, I think that's enough. I don't know why the outro is so hard. I have a really hard time filming this part of the video. It runs, it drives, it lifts, but there are still some problems. The big one being the clutch. It slips pretty bad. Reverse is better, but in forward, it'll barely pull itself, even in low gear. So there must be something I missed on the adjustment for the forward reverse lever, or maybe something in the linkage for the pedal is sticking. 
I don't know. I don't, I don't think the clutch itself is bad because it used to work just fine. It's got to be something external. But I'm out of time today. It's getting dark, getting cold. The weather's supposed to turn on us. Rain and then snow. And I want to get out of here before that happens. So, yeah, that's going to be it. I don't know if there will be another video on this machine or not. I mean, there's plenty more work we could do. The tilt cylinder's leaking. A lot of the hoses are rotted. It's leaking pretty bad from the transmission. The tires go down pretty quickly. Yeah, where do you stop? I think for the time being, it's good enough for what we needed to do, which is kind of work around this property, clean things up. Anyway, I want to thank Area Diesel Service again for the phenomenal job they did on that pump. I just, yeah, I can't say enough good things about my experience working with them. Just a little teaser for the one or two guys who are still watching the video. I did also bring the injection pump and injectors out of my Oliver 1650 down to Area Diesel Service. They went through both of those, or all of those, and they also posted a video about it on their, their YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that video in the description. And I think they said they're working on a discount code for Watch West Work viewers. So if you guys have something that you want them to do, they have a discount code that covers the freight shipping this stuff, I don't know, back to you or to them or something like that. I'll figure out the details. I'll put that in the description box down below. Anyway, thanks again to Area Diesel Service, and thank you guys for watching. Somebody explained this to me. A car went off the road, through the ditch, and took out the fence. This road is perfectly flat, straight, and level for at least another half mile in that direction. And I would say at least five miles in that direction.